so it's, it's a bit more upscale. Uh, cabins, cabins in rural settings on farm, uh, farm stays, but not B&Bs on farms. We're definitely not promoting that. Uh, it's not, b and B is more of a lifestyle choice uh, in some cases rather than a, a, a viable choice for farmers. Um, botels and marinas, um, floating accommodation, as well as, as I mentioned already, the second story downtown apartment rentals, uh, which, which are uh, a possibility. So I'll give you an example of some of the alternative accommodations in other parts of the world. Uh, New York State Vineyard Villas, $311 a night uh, that uh, is being charged. Um, the next one is the uh, Farm Sanctuary, so $275 a night you stay in one of these cabins. And in fact, while you're there, you help with the Farm Sanctuary, which is a, an, an animal uh, sanctuary helping farm animals. And I mentioned the Botels earlier. Uh, here's a catamaran in Maine. You can rent for $339 a night. That's just to sleep in the catamaran. If you want to go on a cruise for 90 minutes, another, it's another 150 bucks. So those are types of accommodation we're talking about. Um, now, when we did the study, we talked about policy, some of the negatives. Right now, uh, most development of this type has to be looked at on a case-by-case -case basis. It's not as of right. Um, our small businesses are unfamiliar with land use process. The costs associated with these types of amendments can be expensive. Uh, the challenges of servicing these types of accommodation is uh, a challenge. And also, hazard lands are attractive for this type of accommodation, but when you try to build something on hazard land, we know where that goes, usually. Uh, so, for example, this main off-grid cabin, $167 a night, uh, it has no running water, it has a wood stove, a propane cooking, uh, limited solar electricity and composting toilet up the lane. This is the type of new accommodation people are seeking out and using all year round. Here's another one um, in the Catskills of New York State, $494 a night, it's a geo geodesic dome over a simple wood platform. You bring your own bed to it, by the way, you don't have a bed uh, that comes with it. It has an outdoor shower, a bath, a sink, an outhouse. It does have electricity as well. It's also very popular. So these are the types of potential accommodations that we could be talking about. Some of the positives of our current policy structure are that our local uh, official plans in all three counties have enabling zoning bylaws that could uh, encourage this type of a development. Our planners are always willing to listen uh, to the developers. Uh, there are more homeowners and farmers interested in becoming legit accommodation as opposed to under the radar, which is what happens when we make it too difficult for them to do this. Uh, OMAFRA is promoting, promoting flexibility on on-farm diversified uses, including farm stays. And of course, our building code, fire code, and health regulations are always there to protect consumers. So that's another positive. We also have our community improvement plans that can be used in terms of incentives to help incent these types of developments. And we've seen how they've been used in other communities like Penyan, New York, a small community of about 5,000 people, where the second story apartment, which normally gets $400 a month for a monthly lease, uh, was renovated and now runs for $215, $215 a night as a tourist accommodation. Uh, we're not advocating all second story units go this way, but if only five or 10% of them did, that would be a great move. So some of the collective needs moving forward among the three counties, we're hoping to have more supportive policies, a clear inexpensive approval process, some tools for homeowners and farmers and small business, and continued collaboration. Uh, we wanna make sure that these types of accommodation are on the radar. Here's a, a tree house bedroom in Georgia for $530 a night. Um, it doesn't include a bathroom, it's in the neighboring house. Um, so these are the types of things that are, that are really gathering a lot of uh, steam. Uh, and so just to wrap up, some of the recommended actions out of the study are that we need to convene our planners and our ECDEV staff, uh, create some solutions to servicing, uh, try to improve the regulations, expand our CIP incentives, develop some how-to manuals, and uh, work with our college to maximize student accommodation. And one of the things we'll be doing as our next step is to work together to research some case studies. Fanshawe College has come on board. We're going to identify one or two sites in each county, and students will help prepare architectural renderings and develop the toolkit for some of the developments. So just wanted to bring you up to speed on that. I appreciate your time, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Clark. Uh, Councillor Black. 
Mr. Chairman, through you to, to Clark. Thanks, Clark. Uh, the pretty innovative ideas. No doubt about, about it, but I think I'd be sleeping in my car rather than paying 500 bucks a night for some of those accommodations. But anyway, um, my question is, uh, when you, you do all this research, um, you know, it's like when we go out there and we offer somebody a free Cadillac, you know, they see all the positive, they say, oh yeah, you know, uh, or maybe I should say Rolls Royce, free Rolls Royce. And, uh, but they forget about you know, how much the insurance is on it and, and how much the new exhaust system and one tire is. So my question is, when you're doing this, will you be assessing all the negative aspects of it? You had a list of positives up there, but I'm sure there's a, a balance sheet on negative and um, how you might address each one of those negative issues. So, you know, you can, um, well, just addressing them so they, they are no longer negative or at least they're minimized. Sure, and through the chair uh, to Councillor Black, definitely as part of the toolkit concept of helping homeowners or property owners uh, explore their opportunities, we're going to be explaining all the various regulatory issues are, as well as business related ones. You mentioned insurance, that's one of course, and servicing issues. So hopefully we can find uh, some kind of path for them to go through that, that isn't, uh, you know, that, that doesn't present a lot of hurdles, but at the same time opens up the opportunity. So yes, all, all aspects of it are gonna be addressed. Thanks for that, but I'm also meaning like uh, neighbors or uh, um, anybody that may be opposing something like this is what I'm thinking more of than just the, the red tape issue, and that's a hurdle unto itself, but just uh, mitigating any, any concerns that uh, the public may have. And through the chair, um, I guess the, the key message I want to get across too is that a lot of this is happening under the radar now, and neighbors may not even know about it. Um, if you go on Airbnb, for example, you'll see lots of accommodation in Norfolk County that's being rented out on a nightly basis that isn't legit. Uh, and so we want to, we, what we try to want to do is, is raise the awareness of the importance of making it more mainstream and legit. And of course, that includes ensuring that your neighbors are on board and that they don't see it as something that's going to negatively impact their quality of life, for sure. Councillor Oliver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks, Clark, for that very interesting presentation. Uh, I have, I guess, two questions, but I'll, the main one I, I wanted to touch on is, is something that you emphasized twice during the presentation, and that is the, the regulatory aspect of this. It's all very well and good for us to encourage property owners to do it, but if we put too many hurdles in front of them, obviously they may not be willing to, to take it on. So the suggestion, I think, from your study of getting the ECDEV folks the planners and the building officials in the same room at the same time is a really, really good idea. Even better if you get the three counties in the same room at the same time. Has that happened yet? And if not, is it on the horizon as part of this project to get those parties together to work out a solution that will work for property owners? Uh, through the chair, um, uh, definitely the three economic development offices talk on a regular basis. As I think the, all the different planners, all, everyone has their network that they work with. And I, and I think the next step will be to try to get some key players in a room together. So no, it hasn't happened yet, okay. but it's a key next step. And I think each of the counties are kind of doing the information uh, presentations right now. And, and okay. then we'll get together again and talk about these next steps. Okay, thank you. And a secondary, if I could, Mr. Mm -hmm. Chairman, with respect to our own situation here in Norfolk County, Obviously, perhaps this is very timely and that we're just in the final stages of our OP review. From your perspective as the manager of tourism and ECDEV and discussing with your planning department colleagues, is our OP as it is drafted today to be approved as our, our revisions, is it going to facilitate this type of thing or are there still amendments that would be needed to, to make this kind of development easier well, or more as of right as you described it. And I, I wouldn't be the, the person to kind of say one way or the other on that one, but I do know that the, that the planning, the planner in, in charge of it and the, the consultant have been very open and have accepted all of this information as we've been preparing it and reading it and including mentions and wording within the draft um, new document. So I think they're very open to these concepts. It, it's a case of also getting the political buy-in too. So, uh, so yeah, our, our planners have been really open and, and willing and eager to listen for sure. So I'm hopeful that we will get 
to that as of right stage at some point, maybe at the zoning bylaw stage. Go ahead. Sorry to belabor the point, but I know Chris is listening to this and I know he and his staff will be very supportive. So perhaps at our special uh, OP meeting this coming Thursday, one of us will, will ask that question or, or staff may bring it up proactively. Because I think that the timing is really, really good for us to be considering trying to make this a new opportunity for people in our county. Thank you. Councillor Columbus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A couple of questions, Clerk. Um, how many of these do you anticipate, say, to get started? Uh, how many would you anticipate to be in the county? And would you need a, a minor variance to go through the process to activate the application? Uh, yeah, through the chair, I, I, I really don't. It would depend, as I said, on the, on the case, right, on the property, and depending what the zoning is on the property, that type of thing. So part of what we want to do through the toolkit is to, is to kind of clarify some of those things so that it isn't, cumbersome or too complicated for a farmer, for example, to want to put up a cabin, you know, um, to have some of those questions answered. In terms of the number, um, you know what, like we mentioned, you know, it would be great to have a 10% increase in them. So we're talking, you know, if even we could open a couple of dozen things over the next year, uh, whatever it may be, uh, that would be great. So we're not trying to pin it down too much. We're just getting the word out and getting people thinking about it and getting the wheels turning. Okay, thank you for that. And you mentioned that the planners, planners were listening, but is the building and bylaw division with the building code type thing and the health unit, are they listening to uh, what you're planning? Yeah, we, I mean, we work really closely with, with both the health unit and our building officials, and, and they're always open to talk about things and make sure that they're safe. That's the main reason, because you don't want visitors to uh, come to your community and, and you know, not be safe. So uh, they're, you know, they're all willing to talk about it and make sure that it complies. And I think that's part of the issue is just, um, you know, trying to get rid of that confusion or, or try to combat the feeling that things are too complicated. I think if we can not dumb it down, that's not the right word, but if we can try to clarify things a bit and make people understand that it may not be as complicated as you think, uh, then that'll go a long way to helping out. Thank you. Councilor Black. Mr. Chairman, I thought I uh, just looked over into the uh, audience and saw Mr. Castellani cringe a little bit on the uh, assessment aspect of it. Uh, would that have to be addressed? Assessment? Um, yeah, I, I would assume our, our Treasury folks would be the, the experts on that and, and assessment as well. It would be like, you know, having a B&B &B in your home. Or, you know, it's, it's not like this is a new concept. This has happened in many, many jurisdictions. So I, I think it's, there's a way to figure it out. I mean, all aspects of, of doing something like this in your, in, on your property need to be looked at. But like I say, we don't want to turn it into something that becomes so complicated that it, it, it you know, uh, confuses people, for sure. Councilor Brunton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Clark, I asked you this question at uh, LPRCA the other night, and that was, um, have you asked for some form of uh, wording in the OP that kind of covers this off? Have you, have you dealt with that part of it? Uh, yeah, through the chair, we, I mean, as I said, we've been in discussions with the planners. I don't know what the wording is personally that would be that would be the best to go in there. They would be, you know, the planners would be the best to answer that question. But I do know we have been in conversation. We've talked about it. They're aware of the importance of the issue. So I'm hopeful that wording will be, you know, positive when it, because I don't know technically what you need to have in the official. Well, you've plan. asked them to oh, provide definitely. something. Yes, and we've been talking about this for months. So will we on, I think, what is it, Thursday we're meeting with? Staff, or will we see some form of wording in there that you've asked for? Um, I've seen the words accommodation and different things mentioned okay. in it. So, I mean, it's worthwhile asking, but I'm sure they can respond to your questions on that. Okay. And the other question for me, Mr. Chairman, you, um, you kind of touched on it that this is going on now under the radar. And uh, I would assume there's a lot of it going on as a cash business, not anything where people want to get into rezoning or official plan amendments, things like that, because it's all of a sudden all the 
the barriers go up for cost and so so forth and income tax. You know what I mean? It's all. So I would think, you know, use the word, the underground economy will flourish if uh, people can open this market up. And through that, the chair, yeah, you're right. It's happening. It is happening already. Right. It's happening all around the world. So it's part of the whole social media sharing economy, all those things. So I think the main message is make it legit, make it safe, yeah. make it uh, fair for your neighbors. Um, but at the same time, you've got to make it easy and streamlined for people to become legit. Right. And if, you know, if, and I'll say this, if they can accommodate overnight somehow, and even if that is under the radar, maybe the next day all the things they do will be above board. Make sense? Theoretically. Thank you. <laughs> Seeing no further hands, thank you very much, Claire, uh, Clark, and uh, we hope that uh, we'll come to fruition. Next, we have a presentation from Mr. Lou Castellan, account manager from Impact Reform Tax Ratios. You're on, sir. There we go. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for uh, inviting me here to discuss the farm valuation. So I'm going to. Yep, there we go. So I'm going to reverse this back to the original starting slide here. Okay, so the farm assessment for the 2016 assessment update. One of the most important factors for MPAC is that Everything we do is legislated, and farms is no different. So under Section 19.5 of the Assessment Act, it says that farm land and farm buildings will be valued using sales of properties that are sales from of farm land to farmers. And then we have to also give consideration to the type of land that is encompasses what that's there. Uh, it, for the property itself, as well as one of the most important factors is its current use. So not what is its potential, but what is it being used for currently. So in consultation with the municipal as well as industry stakeholders, MPAC was challenged through the special purpose review to review also the assessment the 2016 assessment update in how we actually value farms. So in order to do that, we have to take a look at our sales investigation process. So we came up with some new and improved uh, impl uh, implementations. And the first one that you see there is the verification process. So what we did was we've sent out to all new owners the a letter a standard letter as well as a questionnaire and on a monthly basis and that way we can capture all of the information to ensure that these properties once sold are still being used as farms we increased the sales period from three to five years to six to eight years so that meant that we were looking back to 2008 and in doing that now we cre can create greater market evidence to support the valuation that we're establishing. And ultimately, at the end there, is the geographic area. So we're looking at areas that are comparable and more uh, similar to one another. We had originally 228 economic neighborhoods for farms across the province, and we reduced it down to uh, 167. So what are some of the things that we're looking for when we do these investigations? Well. We want to ensure that the purchaser, are they actually a farmer? What were the conditions involved in the sale? What about the chattels? Was there anything in that sale price that we should be looking at? Equipment, quota, crops or livestock? And the use of the property. Is it continued to be used as a farm? What are some of the things that we review? Well, we contact the owner, we do a property inspection, we verify through aerial, aerial photos, uh, we, we examine the deed to make sure that all the information is, 
proves that uh, what we're looking at is a sale of farmland to farmer and confirmation of ownership that the farmer is uh, actually one of the farmers. So what goes into the actual farm valuation? Well, the farmland, if there is a residence and the residence land, the farm outbuildings and other buildings. So let's talk a little bit about those. So farmland. So MPAC is using, as I've mentioned, farmland to farmer sales. The assessment of the farm is not based on its potential use, right? It's based on what it is currently used as, and in this case, it would be a farm. The farmland classes are from one to six, one being the highest and being the most fertile soil. And uh, the other factors that are considered are climate as well as location. And this is included in the farm tax class category. The farm outbuildings themselves are valued using Impact's uh, agricultural cost guide and are valued as the replacement cost new, less depreciation. And it qualifies for the inclusion in the farm property tax class. The residence itself does not qualify for the farm tax. It goes into the residential tax class and it's valued using the replacement cost new less depreciation. Now the residence land, this is, there's two scenarios here and in, in both cases they does fall into the uh, residential tax class, not the farm. So the first being if the land is, or if the residence is occupied by the farmer or a tenant farmer who's farming that property, then the land underneath that um, th that residential land is valued using the highest rate per acre for that farm. So if it's class two land and it's 7,000 an acre and there's two acres that are being used residentially, then that would attribute to 14,000. The second scenario is what if that two acres is occupied by someone who's not a farmer? They're a non-farmer, they just bought the 50 acre parcel and now they, they occupy it and they rent out part of that. The residential portion of that land is valued on a rate per acre that is determined on what the overall value of that property would be residentially and then we determine what that rate per acre would be. So if we were going to do simple math, if the property was uh, 50 acres and it sold for a million dollars, that would be $20,000 per acre, and for those two acres, it would be 40,000. Other buildings, so these are valued using the replacement cost new, less depreciation as well, and it, it too has two different scenarios. The first being if it's value added, so if it's contiguous with the farm itself, so it's being used to sell the product from the farm itself. The land underneath that building would be considered farmland and it would be the highest land value of the highest land class for that land. The second being dual use. So in this case, the secondary use in that case would be there'd be part of the property would be farm. The other part would be unrelated to the farm whatsoever. <coughs> and that would have the associated uh, commercial or industrial land valuation along with it. And these two do not qualify for the farm tax class uh, classification. So in accordance to the Ontario Regulation 282-98, which is further to the Assessment Act, providing a little bit more clarification, the <coughs> farm property class is identified, but it all falls under the umbrella, umbrella of residential property class. So if it is not, or does not qualify in accordance to OMAFRA, or they are no longer part of the farming, then it goes automatically to residential. So the two examples there is the residential property class, uh, quite simply, the residence, the residence land, and any other buildings, they get the residential tax rate. The farm, on the other hand, if they have met the eligibility requirements of OMAFRA, 
would be in the farm tax class rate. And typically that's taxed at 25%. And the residential tax rate applies if that property is no longer considered a farm. So with the notice itself, MPAC, again, in consultation with uh, a number of the different groups, uh, property owners, and we also reached out to the farming community to say, how can we better this property notice so it's easier for you to read, so you can understand it better, so you know what you're looking at. And some of the things that are standard on there is the issue date, which is important for knowing when uh, you can uh, file a request for reconsideration the 2016 assessed value, uh, account information so that they can get into a, uh, about my property as well as uh, their roll number, uh, location and description. But one of the things that they pointed out to us was we identify our farms by acreage. So, you, you know, all those other items are really good, but to know it's concession, three, lot, all of that information, that's really wonderful. But for us, if you tell us it's the 50.5 acre, we can relate very easily to this notice belongs to that property. And the contact information is there. Um, on the part way down, it also talks about the valuation change from 2012 to 2016 uh, current value assessment. And then it gives information about the phase-ins but I really want to point out your attention to that one point at the bottom there that's, that's uh, in red. And that basically tells the property owner whether they are being assessed in the farm tax class or the residential. So I'll look at this a little bit better on this next slide. The statement itself on this particular notice says your property is assessed as a farm. However, the farm portion is currently in the residential property class. So a farmer could have been farming this property for the last 50 years, but if they make any changes to that property insofar as title goes, it will remove them from that uh, classification. I'll give you an example. If they have a severance and they sever off two one-acre lots and one for their son and one for their daughter, OMAFRA has no idea if with that new deed, are they still farming, yes or no. So they will send them the forms to fill out. Sometimes the farmer will understand, oh, I need to fill these out and send them back, but other times they'll just say, and this has just been through experience, that I've been farming this all this time, why do I have to fill this out? They know I'm a farmer, I've got, they have my registration number, why am I filling this out, and they don't fill it out. If OMAFRA does not receive that paperwork in return, they remove them from being in that class because they didn't get the paperwork to say that they are still being uh, actively farmed. So in conjunction with OMAFRA, they have stated that if this happens, that they gave us permission to put right on the face of the notice their contact information so that that property owner can contact them and have this corrected. Another part of the notice is that it shows the, uh, it talks a little bit about the 25% residential rate that is applied for the farm property tax, uh, tax rate program. And that is the, the Ministry of Finance wanted to make sure that that was on there so that the property under owners understood that. One of the popular misconceptions was that well, if I own the property, I say where the taxes go for directing school support. School support is directed by the occupants of that uh, residents. So that was one of the other parts of the notice that they said, well, you should really put that on there so that all property owners who have farms know that. And how will my municipality use my impacts property assessment? That uh, was also put on the notice so that they can see that the taxes that are collected by the municipality are for services that are provided. So who are the experts, really? Well, MPAC, in order to try and do a, uh, conduct a better assessment update, farm outreach, right? We, it was a targeted strategy. We, did, we conducted advanced communication and disclosure, especially with OMAFRA and the OFA. They partnered with us 
right from the start in order to ensure that we were on the right track and we consulted with them quite a bit. But who are the other experts? The farmers themselves. So what we did was we go to the uh, farm conferences and the trade shows. Who better to talk to about a farm than a farmer? Uh, to date, we've uh, over 40 farm specific outreach events have happened. So the market trends. So MPAC, again, looking at not just our own information and reaching out to all of these different organizations, we also check the reports that are put out by the third party experts. So in this case, we reviewed what did uh, the reports come from Valco? What, what did they say about the values? And it validated that we were on the right track and that our values were accurate. Farm Credit Canada, this is their 2015 farmland report. And you can see even in 2015, there was still a 6.6% increase. But if you look at from the 2012 through to the 2016, which is the two base years that MPAC was responsible for, that's a 65% increase in farmland rates. So what, what are some of the driving factors that are causing all of this? On this slide here, you can see, I'm not going to read them all to you, but you can see there that the interest, uh, the low interest rates have a, a, a very heavy bearing on this. Uh, more land is needed. Uh, farmland sales um, continue to rise. And lower pr priced land available in the Northeast. So let's talk about this geographic area and this neighborhood, this farmland neighborhood. So for this one, you can see on the map itself, we have Norfolk in the bottom left, we have Haldeman, and we have Brant County. So it appears that Highway 3 being the division line there, south of that, we are looking at 9,200 an acre. So the different colors, schemes, and it's difficult to see on, on that screen, but uh, the different colors, the, high, the, the darker the, the color, the higher the value. So for Norfolk, it's 9,200 an acre, except that northeast, uh, northwest quadrant there, where it is uh, at 11,175 per acre and that is for class one farmland. The circles there that indicate a percentage, that is the percentage increase from the 2016 tax year to the first year of the phase in, which is the 2017 uh, tax year. So that's only showing you the one year increase. I know I've spoken to you about, about my property before, but I'll, uh, I'll just go through quickly as to show you what's happening here for the farmland information. The market trends, without even logging in, if you went to About My Property, you could find the market trends for anywhere in the province. Once you click on the market trends, it'll come up and it'll ask you what property type do you want to investigate. You would click on whichever one it was. In this case, we would click on farms. And then it asks you what municipality do you wish to have displayed. So you would click in Norfolk and it would bring up Hald Brant Haldeman Norfolk and it would show that. If you wanted Wellington County, you would type in Wellington and it would come up. Oxford County, that would come up and it would show you the, that information. For the purpose of this example, this is Wellington County and it shows you this is what will be displayed once you've selected whichever municipality it is. It'll show you in it the map of that area as well as the rate per acre for class one farmland. The, as I mentioned before, the darker the color, the higher the rate per acre. As well, the going, as you're going through about my property, there are interactive videos, there are tutorials. It uh, speaks to how valuation is done for farm properties, residential properties, uh, the, how the buildings are valued. Um, and once an individual has reviewed it, if they disagree with the assessment, they have the right to file a request for reconsideration, which is free of charge. And 
uh, that's all in the actual application, so they don't have to change an application to do so. And there are frequently asked questions there as well. So once they're in, they've logged into the application itself, it'll show their property and it'll show all the information. And this is something that we've recommended to all property owners. When you have you, your notice, go into About My Property and take a look at it and see, do we have the right acreage? Do we have all the correct buildings? Uh, is you know the number of bathrooms all of that information is there for the property owner to review and make sure that it's correct if they select my neighborhood which is in the top right hand corner it allows them to look at uh, up to a hundred properties in their area so that they can review those properties to see um, what is actually trans ha or what's happening in their neighborhood as well they can select up to 24 properties that they wish to compare themselves to. They don't have to select all 24, but they have up to 24 that they would select. Once they've selected those, they can download the report, and this is what it looks like. And it shows the subject property, as well as all the ones that they wish to compare themselves to. They can download that report, they can print it, and they can save it. There are resources, there are pamphlets, uh, there's the About My Property uh, website. There's also mpac.ca website, uh, which also has the interactive videos and interactive, uh, shows you how to actually use some of the applications. And in this case, we have a farm video here, but uh, it's about four minutes and 14 seconds, so you can watch it at your leisure. I'm going to supply uh, Jill with the link so that all of you will have it. It's a YouTube link. So even if you just went to mpac.youtube uh, and uh, typed in mpac videos, you would see not only the farm video there, but a lot of different videos that would actually explain how assessment is done. And that's the presentation. Any questions? Councillor Black. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, through you to Mr. Castellani. Uh, I just wondered, you talked briefly about the request for re reconsideration or a, a further along a, a formal appeal. Um, I just wondered, how, do you have a figure that tells you how many or what the percentage of farmland is actually appealed? Uh, through the chair, I do. There are currently, for 2017, 89 requests for reconsideration for farm properties. Well, what, what would that be in terms of a percentage of the total? It is 2%. 2%? And of that, I, I guess you'd have to look at past information. You wouldn't know right now, currently, of that 2%. But let's say last year or a year before, it was 2%. Of that 2%, what percentage of that 2% are actually lowered? Uh, through the chair, it, it all depends on the actual circumstances of that property. Especially now with about my property, people are going in and they're saying, they're showing that I have 23 buildings, but I, I only have 12. And it could have been old uh, barns that they've removed and haven't notified MPAC. So that, in those instances, we have to correct those. Um, but if there's no other market evidence, then it would be upheld. So to actually say of the 89 that we currently have, 50% uh, would be changed. It would be too mm -hmm. difficult. I wouldn't, you need to know the circumstances on a case by case. I guess what I'm asking you is um, your own performance measurement and how, how accurate are you in assessing the, the value of uh, farmland? Uh, through the chair, I, I don't have the actual number itself, but um, typically are looking through some of the information that we have on record. It's usually about two percent to five percent. Sorry, two to two, two to five percent. Two to five percent. Okay, that's, that's not too bad. It's, it's like ninety-eight and ninety-five to ninety-eight uh, percent on the other side. Okay, thank you for that. Just another question. <coughs> Um, I know we're going to be dealing with uh, a report that talks about uh, the possibility of lowering, lowering the farm rate from 2.5 down further. And um, I found it interesting what you said, that you c 
consider values uh, and sales only from farmers to farmers. So in essence, would it be correct for me to say that it's the farmers that are increasing the value of the farmland? Uh, through the chair, MPAC only reflects the market. We don't create the market. So we'll analyze the sales to determine what the farmland sold to a farmer. Okay. So if the values have increased because of those, that sales investigation, then that's what we report for the valuation portion of it. Okay, but, uh, it makes sense to me if you extrapolate that, it's the farmers that are increasing the value of it. Okay, thanks very much. Councillor Columbus, then Councillor Oliver. Yes, thank you Mr. Chairman and Mr. Castanelli. You would mentioned the situation where someone applied for two lots off the farm and the class changed, right? And uh, I've had two situations in my ward where someone had passed away the operator of the farm and his th this happened so it changed title it uh, the person deceased that did all the paperwork and filed all the paperwork and it turned out that the wife wasn't aware of it and for two years they were taxed at a different rate do you find that happen very often when someone is, is deceased from the farm operation uh, through the chair I that's that's a difficult question in yeah. so far as I don't know how many in, in instances where yeah. You know, there's a survivorship situation. I guess it's important to read read the paperwork you get in the mail. I guess um, the other one is: Do you have to be registered as a farm operation, like make that seven thousand dollars per year off the farm, to to be classified as a farm under your program, through the, registered through the OFA or the Christian Farmers Association? Uh, through the chair, the determination for farm, whether they qualify for that tax class, is done by OMAFRA, and they have a series of requirements, of which is the, the 7,000, has to be a Canadian uh, citizen, those types of things. Yes. Okay, thank but it's you. OMAFRA that makes that de decision. Thanks very much. Councillor Oliver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thanks, Lou, for your presentation. My questioning follows up on Councillor Black's in terms of what you told us as part of MPAC's attempt to be fair in this, you, you verified that sales of farmland were only co considered if they were sold to another farmer and continued to be used as farmland. First of all, that's correct. I'm just reaffirming that. Through the chair, yes. Okay. The other two things as well were of interest to me when I heard you say them, and that is that you, you enlarged the, the period during which you evaluated these transactions Instead of being the usual three to five, you went six to eight or something to that effect. And, and you broadened the geographic area. So if it was just here in Norfolk County where land is selling at a high rate because it's being used for ginseng, that would skew the figures. And so you enlarge the geographic areas within which you made those studies. And I, first of all, I hope that's correct, that it does reflect what you said. But have you done that for other classes as well, or only for the farmland transactions because of the very significant jump that, that they've experienced compared to the other classes like residential? Uh, through the chair, we always try to ensure that the neighborhood that we're going to be uh, including uh, for all of the different properties is uh, similar and contiguous, right? So we want to make sure that they're similar in nature. We don't want to compare properties that are um, not similar because then one will skew the other. So in, in your uh, example of, you know, bringing it, skewing the figures, we would look at all the sales in this area that would be both, um, it doesn't matter what type it is, but we would make sure that, was it a farm? Yes. Farmland, and was it sold to a farmer? And we would make sure that we continue to include that sale in our analysis. Yes, I, I, I understand that, and I'm sorry, I must not have explained myself very clearly, but, but the fact that for this, this particular uh, reassessment from 2012 to 2016, with respect to farmland, you, you uh, increase the period of time, the history of sales that you analyzed, and you changed the geographic area, you broadened, I think was your term, the geographic areas within which you were making comparisons. Did you do that for all classes of assessment or only for the farmland class this time? 
uh, for the through the chair for this instance for the farm and i'm just speaking for the farm right now yes yes we we did that because we found that we we needed more information more market evidence so we increased the number of years to review right so there's more sales and we time adjust them to make sure yep. that they're all similar okay now for other property types like you've mentioned like residential, residential okay we look at that so if we have new subdivisions coming online does that market fit with the old or an original neighborhood, or do we need to create a new neighborhood? So yes, MPAC looks at all of those factors for, for the residential as well as the farm. Okay. We always have to make sure that our far, whatever our neighborhoods are, that they're similar in nature. Right. Okay, thank you. Mayor Luke. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair Lou. Thanks for your presentation. Quick question, someone, and I'm not sure, I cannot recall who, but someone told me that if we were to lower uh, class, say if we were to lower farmland from a 25% assessment down to say 20, that we cannot raise it, we can only lower it. Do you know if that's true? In other words, we couldn't drop it to 20% this year and the next year raise it from 20 to say 23. Do you know anything about that or was I misinformed? Uh, through the chair, that's, MPAC has no jurisdiction over the, the tax rates themselves. That's governed by the Municipal Act. Okay, so, um, I'd have to go to the Municipal Act, thank you. I have a question, you, with some of the, your early um, slides that you have, you talked about equipment and quota and a bunch of other things. Are they taken into consideration as to the value of the farm or how, why was that brought up, I guess? Uh, through, through you, the Chair. The reason that that's brought up is to ensure that the value of that, or the sale price, what does that actually include? Is it just the land itself, or, are there, or is there anything else that we need to consider? So if there was you know, combines worth $50,000, then we would have to remove that because that's not indicative of what that land was selling for. So we, what we're trying to do is, is look at that sale price and ascertain exactly what it included. Okay, okay. thank you. Councillor Height. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, through you to the deputation. So uh, some of the questions are on your slide there. You mentioned that if a farmer owns the residence as part of the farming operation, he only pays the farm rate on his residence? Uh, through the chair, the land underneath that house, so whatever is being used for residence, okay? Right. Use an example of two acres. That would be the best farmland rate per acre on that property. So if it was class one, it could be the 9,200 an acre, right? So it would be 9,200 an acre for each of those two acres. Okay. Okay, yeah. And, but if it was a non-farmer, we would value the entire property as if it were residential. Yeah. So if it's a 50-acre parcel, what would a 50-acre parcel be worth? Mm -hmm. And then... Um, we would then determine what the rate per acre would be do using that method and then applying that to the two acres. Okay, so for the farmer himself, you would value the land as the farmland, and then this house and buildings, uh, you would come up with some type of figure on what they're worth? Yes, through Floating the chair. Floating on the land, I suppose? The, through the chair, that, those buildings would be the replacement cost, new less, less depreciation okay. in both an, examples. Okay, thank you. And uh, further, Chair, to that is, so say a farmer owns one farm and he's looking to buy another farm, and when he does, there's a surplus dwelling on there that he doesn't want. So what I find at, at County Council here, we don't allow them to sever their, that surplus dwelling off, so now they have to pay a residential tax on a house that they don't want. Is that correct? Uh, through the Chair, if it's, it's not being used in, in conjunction with the farm, then it would be in the residential tax rate. Right, so they're, they're paying full residential on that surplus dwelling that they don't really want in the end. And then uh, my last question would be, you mentioned you increased the range of the farm sales to come up with the figure. But by doing that, you would have, you've looked back further in history where farmland would have been less. Because as we know, housing, all values have risen in the last eight years or 20 years for that matter. But did, you actually, did it actually lower the price? If you were to compare your three to four window snapshot to your six to eight? Uh, through the chair, all those sales would have been adjusted to a point in time. Oh, I see. 
So you like a f inflationary figure? That is correct, and we would look to the records, such as I mentioned, uh, the Ontario, the Farm Credit Canada. Okay. We would look at things like that to determine help us with our time adjustments. Yeah, it makes sense. Thank you, Councillor Oliver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for allowing a second question. Councillor Height just uh, uh, tweaked something else in my mind, Alou, from your presentation, and this deals with the value added buildings. You, you explain to us that the actual farm buildings are assessed as part of the, the farm rate, 0.25 of the residential, or they're assessed that way, but a value-added building. So in other words, we've made a really big deal here in this county of trying to encourage our OP and other documents to, to, to encourage added value activities on the farm, such as wineries or, as per Clark's presentation, perhaps overnight accommodation, on the, et cetera. And those are legitimate farm-related activities. So why wouldn't such a building, a value-added building for the winery or for the retail sales within the winery, be classified as a farm building as well? Un unless I misunderstood. They should be assessed the same way that the barn where they store the hay is assessed, given our trend in Ontario of encouraging more value-added agriculture. Uh, through the chair, the, the land itself underneath that building is the the value per acre is using the the farmland rates for that property okay but okay. i'm talking more about the buildings themselves you described the buildings on a farm as the the farm buildings and then quote other buildings right but does that include a building repurposed or built as a value added part of the farm operation and, and i'm sorry if i'm confusing you but it, it, uh, it seems to me that a building that's being now used as part of a value-added operation on that farm should be assessed the same way that a traditional barn is or a pack barn for tobacco or, or a bulk kiln is as, as a farm building. Uh, and is that not the case, I guess, is uh, what I'm asking. Through the chair, if it's a commercial enterprise that's, that's there, they're selling their product, uh, it, then, of course, then it gets the commercial. Well, but there's, I, there's where I guess I disagree with you. You say if it's a commercial enterprise, it's a value-added farm business. So it's a farm-related business still selling the products of that farm. So why does it have to be assessed as commercial and not as an agricultural building, I guess? Uh, through the chair, if, if I can uh, get back to you with a full response from, from looking at some of the, those, because I don't have that here in front of me. I'd like to see what the, the wineries see exactly the classifications, and I can give you a, a more fulsome answer. Okay. Thank you very much. I guess that's the end of questions. So thank you very much for coming and uh, enlightening us. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to staff report FS17-21, property tax ratio. Is that Jim or James or Sue? Which one? Sue? Uh, it's me. Go. Thank you. Uh, through the chair, oh my God. sorry. Through the chair, um, I'd like to explain the report a little bit. The Municipal Act requires council establish the annual tax ratios through passage of a bylaw. The purpose of the report is to determine the 2017 tax ratios. Once the ratios have been established, the final tax rates will be presented to council for approval so that the 2017 final tax levy may be built. There are two basic elements to property tax system in Ontario, um, as you've learned uh, from the previous presentation about assessment, and there's tax ratios. Um, as discussed earlier in the presentation from MPAC, assessment, reassessment occurs every four years and is based on market value. MPAC has provided the county with updated property assess assessment values as of 2016, and taxes will be based on these uh, values from 2017 to 2020. Assessment increases are phased in over four years. Assessment reductions take effect immediately. A misconception of reassessment is that a rise in assessment value automatically trans trans translates into more revenue for the municipality. Municipalities do not get any additional tax revenue as a direct result of reassessment, but rather reassessment results in a redistribution distribution or a shift in tax burden. It's inevitable that shifts will occur as a result of any reassessment. 
Depending on the market conditions, the value of certain types of property will increase at a faster rate than others. For example, in previous reassessment years, values for waterfront properties in Norfolk County increased significantly as a result of increased sale prices of homes and cottages along the lake. As this report outlines, in the recent reassessment, Norfolk County's farm and managed forest assessments increased the most out of all property tax classes. The assessment regime we have today was part of a provincial tax reform introduced in 1998. Reforms were intended to level the playing field across the province by ensuring that all properties were assessed consistently. Prior to 1998, businesses were taxed based on a realty and a business tax. Farms were taxed at the full residential rate and farmers applied for a farm tax rebate. When market value assessment was introduced, among other things, the separate business tax and farm tax rebate program were replaced by tax ratios with specific ranges and limits depending on the property tax class. The residential tax class is a benchmark and all other ratios are expressed in relation to that ratio. As an example, um, I put in the report, the current commercial tax ratio is 1.6929 meaning that for every dollar residential property owner pays, commercial property owner pays $1.69. Likewise, for every dollar residential property pays, farm property pays 25 cents. As indicated in the report, the tax ratios in Norfolk have not changed since 2001. Setting tax ratios has a direct impact on the apportionment of property taxes across all classes. Recently, farm associations have been lobbying municipalities to reduce the farm tax ratio to lessen the impact that increased farm values have had on their property, will have on their property taxes. The competitiveness of the property tax ratios relative to the treatment of that same class in neighboring jurisdictions should be considered in determining if tax ratio adjustments are warranted. Most municipalities have a farm tax ratio set at 25%, and our research indicates that the majority of municipalities have not reduced the farm tax ratio for 2017. Counties of Elgin, Dufferin, Oxford, Lambton, Gray, Prince Edward all remain at 25%. Chatham-Kent has a farm tax ratio of 22%, but that is, uh, was not done in 2017. It's been reduced for several years now. Haldeman County and Brant County have yet to set their tax ratios. Um, but we reached out to them and were advised that their recommendation will also be to remain at 25%. The tables in the report give examples of the shift in burden that would result by lowering the fact farm tax ratio from 25%. Because 80% of Norfolk County's assessment is residential, the cost of reducing the farm tax ratio would directly affect the residential property ta taxpayers the most. The residential tax rate resulting from the 2017 levy supported operating budget was based on the assumption that tax ratios would remain the same in 2017. A change to a ratio has no net levy impact to the county because the total approved levy will continue to be raised through taxation. It will, however, have an impact on the residential tax rate. Tax ratios were intended to settle the starting point for tax reform they were not intended to be used to adjust tax burden as a result of updated CBA. Staff recommends there be no change to tax ratios for 2017. We would be happy to answer any questions the committee may have regarding the report. Councillor Black. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, I'm just wondering, if we do reduce the rate, from 25 to whatever, 24, 23, 22. Would we have to notify the rest of the taxpayers in Norfolk County that their taxes will be going up as a result of this shift? And how much would that cost for that notification? Go ahead. Who's going? Go ahead. <laughs> Uh, there's a two-part uh, answer. That. One is I don't think we'd have to notify because there's a whole bunch of journalists over there who are equally taking down what we're saying. Uh, but uh, more straightforwardly, if with any adjustment automatically moves uh, the rest of the burden to the other classes, and in our case it'll go to every class because we're below the provincially mandated threshold, 
uh, for the other categories. Uh, so it, there is no legal mechanism to inform. It, it will simply shift the burden and everyone else's taxes will go up. It will just automatically happen. It would automatically happen and they, okay, uh, thank you for that. And uh, um, Sue, the last thing that you said in your report, could you repeat that? It's the, 